Inside this box, a palm-sized tiny machine that runs local LLMs at a decent speed and will try to make it even better. And today, I'm also connecting the most powerful RTX 4090 to it via Oculink. All right, let's open it up. This is a high-end mini PC from GMK Tech, the Evo T1 model, which just launched. Look at that futuristic design. It's incredibly lightweight, only 940 grams and just 1.7 liters in volume. And still, it's powered by Intel's latest top-tier mobile processor. From the interesting ports, we've got Thunderbolt and Oculink. Wait, what's this thing? Ooh, that's a bold statement. I'll keep it in mind. On the front, four USB ports and a mini jack. What's cool is that it has two fans inside, one at the bottom, and I'll show the other one in a bit. Also, it can stand vertically. Hopefully, there's more interesting stuff in the box. This seems to be the power supply, 150 watts as you can see. The second box, nothing noteworthy there. Before we take it apart, let's connect the power supply and see how it runs and what it can do with the built-in GPU. Oh, almost forgot. We need to enable maximum performance mode in the BIOS. To do that, press escape right after hitting the power button. Here it is, power mode select. Choose performance so the CPU runs at the max TDP, 80 watts. The CPU here is the Ultra 9 285H which scores 905,000 points in CPU-Z. Let's log the temperature. Max, 93 degrees Celsius. Average, 83 degrees Celsius. And interestingly, this PC only draws 28 watts at idle and 100 watts under load. Honestly, it's not that loud. Perfectly comfortable. Now, about the games. The graphics here are powered by Intel Arc 140T, and it's roughly on par with the mobile GTX 1650, which is actually pretty solid. For example, take a look. Cyberpunk runs smoothly in full HD on medium settings. In certain games, like God of War, this integrated GPU just isn't optimized. Meanwhile, classics like GTA 5 and Minecraft run great. On ultra settings, they push 70 to 100 FPS. Next, I decided to test a local LLM, DeepSeek 32B. And honestly, you can get it running in literally three clicks. However, there's one catch. With something like Olama, which is one of the simplest tools to run these models, neither the GPU nor the NPU gets utilized, as you can see. So I tried a different app. Then here, finally, the GPU kicked in. Progress! I'm sure with some tuning and enabling NPU acceleration, it could hit the 15 tokens per second promised in the ads for this machine. Let me show you a smarter way to use your PC. First, I'm grabbing a solid VPN. I use ExpressVPN. I want to watch a classic on Netflix. Full metal jacket. Hmm. But here in the US, it doesn't show up in my catalog. So I switch my online location to the UK, tap connect, refresh, and boom! Now it's right there. I'm still paying for the same service, I'm just getting the library that matches the region I chose. This also helps with regional pricing. Stores sometimes list different prices depending on the country, whether it's subscriptions or even some game stores. With ExpressVPN, I can quickly compare what I'd pay in different regions before I decide. And if you choose to go online mostly with your phone, like so many of us do nowadays, that means you're most likely connecting to free public Wi-Fi or the office network. If that's you, remember, the person who controls that Wi-Fi and even the ISP can see a lot about what you're doing online. Thankfully, ExpressVPN encrypts and reroutes all your traffic through one of their secure servers, so your browsing stays private from the Wi-Fi owner and the internet provider. I like that peace of mind. What I notice day to day is this speed. Connections stay fast and stable no matter which country I pick. To try it out, scan the QR code on screen, hit the link below, or go to expressvpn.com slash whatpc to get four months free. Thanks to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this segment. I think you've seen enough by now. This PC has its cards, but not many aces up its sleeve. To take it apart, you'll need some special tools. First, unscrew the three standoffs the PC rests on. It's a pretty interesting engineering decision, but as it turns out, that aluminum plate is purely decorative. Here's the second fan I mentioned earlier. Honestly, I'm not sure how much it actually helps the main one, but hey, it changes color. So that's already a win for RGB lovers. To go deeper, you'll need to unscrew four more screws on the sides. Then you can pull the top cover toward yourself. Here's what it looks like inside. Then. You know what? I figured out the second fan's purpose. It cools the RAM! A full 64 gigabytes of DDR5, as you can see. 
By the way, you can upgrade to 128 gigabytes if that's not enough for you. Though, honestly, these modules don't seem to get too hot. But under heavy load, who knows? Plus, this fan also cools up to three potential NVMe Gen 4 X4 SSDs, which is actually impressive for a mini PC. You can cram in up to 12 terabytes. There's also a heatsink mounted on the included SSD. Let's take it off and see what it is. Oh, it's a Crucial P3 Plus, a model without DRAM cache, but its sustained write speeds across the full capacity actually surprised me in a good way. I'll show those results later. For now, let it rest, and let's move on! We're fully disassembling the PC now and finally reaching the heart of the system. Hopefully there's no liquid metal in there, because that's exactly what I plan to apply! Or spread, not sure which word is right, let me know in the comments. And here it is, the whole computer completely taken apart! Honestly, they could have sold it a hundred bucks cheaper just like this, straight in the box. Just look at it, such a tiny heatsink, yet it dissipates up to 80 watts! And the fan? It's absolutely tiny. Let's give it a break too. Something tells me they might have actually used liquid metal here. Let's check. Mmm. Mm, nope! Looks like regular thermal paste! Or more likely a phase change material, because for thermal paste that's way too thick of a layer. Also, the consistency is pretty thick, even though this PC was built literally no more than a month ago. Just look at it! I did have some doubts, to be honest. Is it even safe to apply liquid metal to CPUs like this? Because, as you can see, this is a chiplet architecture. The CPU is essentially divided into five parts. But then I remembered! My Ultra 7155H is also chiplet based, and it came with liquid metal from the factory. So, let's continue. This is nylon tape. I use it to insulate anything that could potentially short out if it comes into contact with the liquid metal. It's way cheaper than the special SMD coating lacquer, and more importantly, you can easily peel it off later, unlike lacquer. Tape here, tape there, and almost everything's insulated now. The chances of the motherboard surviving contact with liquid metal are looking way better. Now I just need to cut out holes for the screws that I covered with tape. For liquid metal, just like last time, I'm using Thermal Grizzly. Oh crap! I poured too much! One of the drops almost hit the motherboard! Oh, that was close. No worries. I'll just suck up the excess with a syringe. By the way, this syringe comes with a special nozzle. Pretty convenient. Damn! I sucked up all of it. Honestly, it would have been better to spread it first and then remove the excess. After tinning, it was obvious there was too much metal. I tried putting some of it on the heatsink. Maybe that would help reduce the amount, but no, it didn't help. So I did my best to pull the rest back into the syringe, and I think it worked. But then, wow, that was a moment. You should have seen the mess. All the liquid metal, and just to remind you, it was five grams, spilled all over the table. I barely managed to collect it back. And why did that happen? Because I started pressing like this to push out the air, and the metal just started pouring out of the nozzle. I had to keep collecting it back until the plunger finally popped out of the syringe, and you know what? It's all because of the damn black plastic the syringe is made from. <laughs> you can't see anything inside. If it were transparent, I would have known exactly when to stop. But enough talking about fails! Let's go make some! Besides, as you've probably noticed, I know how to handle these things. Hopefully the liquid metal will stay right where it should and won't leak anywhere. By the way, it looks like you can also connect SATA SSDs using these little ports. But there's no proper mounting bracket, unlike that Lenovo mini PC I built last time. Still, one SSD is enough for us. In terms of how difficult it is to access the RAM and SSD, I'd give this PC a 5 out of 10. A bit of hassle, but nothing major. On the previous GMK Tech unit, access was great. That one gets a 1 out of 10 for difficulty. If you want to see what a 10 out of 10 difficulty looks like, check out the other video on my channel. It's there! All right, now let's see if this thing actually powers on. Phew! Well, it looks like it powered on, but the temperature? Honestly, I wasn't impressed at all. It only got about 2 degrees Celsius better on average and 1 degree Celsius lower at peak. And honestly, it wasn't worth the money, stress, or time spent on this whole liquid metal idea. So don't bother with it if you have a similar setup. Now, about the SSD. 
I think most people know by now, the max read-write speeds they advertise are mostly marketing fluff. What really matters is whether the drive can maintain high write speeds across its entire capacity. And this SSD, I have to say, performed really well. Up to full capacity, it averaged around 500 megabytes per second, which is a great result for an SSD without a DRAM cache. Now, let's unbox the docking station. It's called Mini's Forum. Costs around 100 bucks. Not the cheapest option, but it's built solid. I'll leave a link in the description, along with some cheaper alternatives. Sure, it takes up a bit more space, but the big advantage is that you can securely mount the power supply so it's not hanging loose or bouncing around on cables. Now let me show you two versions of this build. One compact, and one not so much. Let's start with the compact one. You can get a Flex ATX power supply. It takes up very little space. You won't be able to screw it in, but you can still connect a not so powerful, but way better than integrated GPU to it. For example, I went with an RTX 4060. And with this kind of setup, you won't face any bandwidth limitations or weird compatibility issues. Just place the mini PC right on top of the PCU, and you're good to go. As for total volume, it's not exactly small. I'd say around 6 liters at least. But if that feels too basic for you, let's go all in. Tear down the whole thing and build a real beast using a full-size ATX power supply. It fits in here perfectly. Then best of all, you can even attach a GPU mounting bracket directly to it. Hook up to a 600 watt adapter and throw in one of the biggest GPUs on the planet. Yes, I know. The RTX 4090 is total overkill for the Oculink interface and there will be performance loss. But hey, we're building the biggest Oculink mini PC in the world. We're allowed to go over the top. This whole PC setup, by the way, weighs a full six kilograms. This is basically a full-fledged desktop at this point. Now that's what I call a power boost with no SMS verification required. From one teraflop to a full 100. Honestly, it looks like an anti-drone turret built to shoot down shot heads. Unplug it, take it with you, plug it back in, then you're gaming in 4K. Oculink is actually a really convenient interface. But let's see what kind of performance loss we get when using such a powerful GPU, and what problems might come up. The first issue I ran into was with the integrated graphics. I had to disable it in the BIOS because it got into a territorial conflict with the discrete GPU over who gets to output to the monitor. I believe GMK Tech will fix this in future BIOS updates. A small thing, but still annoying. And other than that, no real issues. Wait, actually, there's one more thing. Another drawback. Transmissions from hell through the mini jack. Audio from both sides of the PC sounded, let's say, far from ideal. At this price point, that's no small detail. The cheaper model didn't have this issue, although to be fair, I've seen the same problem even on some Macs. So yeah, an external sound card is a must. Here's the one I personally use. The sound is great, really high-end stuff. I'll drop a link in the description in case anyone's interested. Now, let's talk speed. With Oculink, we're getting 6 gigabytes per second, which aligns with Gen 4x4 speeds. For comparison, a full-size PCIe slot gives you 22 gigabytes a second. In real-world gaming, the biggest performance loss I saw was up to 20%, like in Oblivion, for example. 53 FPS versus 61 FPS on a full slot. But what really had me curious was how powerful this new Ultra 9 285H actually is in games, compared to the previous Gen Ultra 7 155H, which you've seen on my channel before. And honestly, the difference from the previous generation is barely noticeable. Yes, the Ultra 9 does show slightly higher FPS, but that's not because of a new architecture. It's most likely due to the fact that it has a 15 watt higher power limit. As a result, it runs at 300 to 400 megahertz higher frequencies. Even though you don't see it on screen, MSI Afterburner isn't showing the frequency for some reason. But still, even with that advantage, the desktop i9-14900K is 40% faster in games, as you can see on the graph. That said, this one processor alone uses 80% more power than the entire mini PC from the wall. If you compare Ultra 9 with the previous gen Ultra 7, you're looking at about 10% plus performance increase. Overall, from what I understand, the computer is positioned not so much as a gaming machine, but more as a local LLM runner. You can install up to 128 gigabytes of DDR5, which theoretically allows you to run even 70B models locally. So, this computer definitely isn't for everyone, but in its niche, it's extremely effective. The energy efficiency especially stands out. 
By the way, this was a sponsored review, but I've tried to be as objective as possible. I'm not trying to sell you anything. The decision is entirely up to you. If you like this computer, all the links are in the description below. It handles the workload confidently. It runs the CPU at 80 watts, keeps noise levels fairly low under load, and still stays reasonably compact. Hope you found this video interesting. See you next time.